I got a word of knowledge, a word of prophecy. The Calvinists, these guys are going to dominate YouTube. Coming to you live, rent free, all bills pay, all everything pay, free internet, free utilities, from Leighton Flowers' own mind, it's the Five Flames Podcast. Calvinists are dominating the internet. Calvinist. That's my man, Dr. Kim. Hey, Desiree, did you know that Hebrews teaches that they're aliens? I've, I've never um, been privileged to that information. Oh, yeah. Dr. Kim just dropped that latest vid. There's aliens in the book of Hebrews. Nice. Hebrews chapter 6. Nice. Go look it up. They were there all along. They were there all along. I mean... If Dr. Kim said it. He's very smart because he said um, (laughs) he's going to dominate this YouTube. Yeah, he knows. He knows. Okay. Welcome to the Five Flames podcast. What are the Five Flames? Sola Scriptura. Sola Fide. Sola Gracia. Sola Christi. And Sola De Gloria. All right. Welcome to the Five Flames podcast. Hope you enjoyed last week's episode. Desiree and I had a fun time recording it. Hopefully this one is not an hour and a half long, babe. Yeah. But good news, we only have half the script. Nice. Yeah. <clears throat> so a little housekeeping before we get started. Last week we brought up James White's response to Faith on Fire's analogy. Um I just want to clarify that we respect Dr. White. His ministry has blessed me for 22 years. Um, In the last 22 years, I've been a student of theology. His ministry has blessed me. Dr. White and I are actually acquaintances. We have met several times, and we even shared a meal together. Uh, And we spoke privately about cycling and tow rigs. He's a good man and a giant of faith, and I just want to say that he's in our prayers. Um, I was able to attend his debate with Tim Stratton. I was so happy when Dr. White told him that his baby arrowsing comment was uncalled for. And uh, I confronted Stratton after the show about what he said. And I told Stratton the same thing. And I shared the story of Henry. Stratton asked me what I thought about his death, uh, my son's death. I said I was devastated, but I'm okay because God has given him a purpose. And that is what inspired us to start the Henry Project was actually that conversation. So thanks, Stratton. Desiree, what's on the big show today? Uh, Today, we're going to look at a brief history of the Protestant Reformation, uh, one of the popular critiques of Calvinism, and in the news, uh, Stephen Avery's latest appeal in August, back in August, has been denied, and we have an exciting announcement. So as always, we have a crap ton of information to throw out there in the ether, so let's get into it. We're going to be talking about the Protestant Reformation. Much of my information from Martin Luther is going to be coming from John Piper's sermon series or lecture series, Men Who the World Are Not Worthy. And this is his lecture on Martin Luther. Desiree, what was the Reformation about? It's about a lot of things. Um, The selling of indulgences, um, 95 theses. Yes, that is correct. But the most important thing, the Reformation was about the discovery of the Bible. One of Luther's arch opponents in the Roman church, Sylvester Perius, wrote in response Luther's 95 thesis, he who does not accept the doctrine of the church of Rome and pontiff of Rome is an infallible rule of faith from which the Holy Scriptures to draw their strength and authority is a heretic. Piper says, in other words, the church and the Pope are the authoritative deposit of salvation in the word of God. And the book is derivative and secondary. What is new in Luther, Heiko Obermann says, is the notion of absolute obedience to the scriptures against any authorities, be they popes or councils. In other words, the saving, sanctifying, authoritative word of God comes to us in a book 
The implications of this simple observation are tremendous. Um, I am so excited to be able to be able to talk about Martin Luther and John Calvin in the absolute desert that has been the Calvinism heresy, the Calvanic panic. Desiree, are you surviving the Calvanic panic of 2023? I'm not ready for that yet. The Calvanic panic, it's coming. It's here. So I, it's so nice to be this wellspring of the Protestant Reformation, this rediscovery of the Bible, this rediscovery of faith. And I get to talk about it. Oh, praise God. Okay. Some background on Luther. Luther was an Augustinian monk, professor his whole life, and a lecturer. He was born November 10th, 1483 in Eschleben, Germany. Was that good? Was that good? It's good. Eschleben, Germany. His dad was a copper miner who wanted him to be a lawyer. Almost nothing is known about his first 18 years. He received a bachelor's degree in 1501 from the University of Erfurt. It was actually a very prestigious university. I have no idea if it's still there. January 1505, he received a master's degree in arts. In June 2nd, 1505, lightning knocked him off his horse. He was so frightened that he cried out, help me, St. Anne, and I will become a monk. Two weeks later, he enrolled, or whatever it is, he, he signed up. He became an honest Augustinian monk. There's a lot of events. Of course, every event, pretty much, like if he wouldn't have done this and he wouldn't have done that, he wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been a Protestant Reformation, but there's a lot of events that this wouldn't happen, there wouldn't be a Protestant Reformation. If the lightning wouldn't have struck near the horse and knocked him off his horse, there, there might not have been a Protestant Reformation. Well, he could have said, uh, never mind. He could have said I'll that. No, never mind. <laughs> he could have said, that was unfortunate. Let me go back to law school and figure this out. Yeah. no. But he, he did. He followed through. Yeah. He became a monk. Praise God, he became a monk. So again, two weeks later, he was an Augustinian monk. He was ordained as a priest in 1507. And in 1509, John Calvin was born. In 1510, he traveled to Rome on a pilgrimage. He later summed up his experience. Where God builds a church, the devil puts up a chapel next door. It is almost incredible. What infamous actions are committed at Rome, one could require to see it and hear it in order to believe it. It is an ordinary saying that if there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. It is an abyss from hence all sins proceed. Rome, once the holiest cities, was now the worst. While in the monastery, he struggled with his soul. Luther, I did not think about women, money, or possessions. Instead, my heart trembled and fidgeted about whether a God would bestow his grace on me. For I had strayed from faith, and I could not but imagine that I had angered God, whom I in turn had to appease by doing good works. He said, if I could believe God was not angry with me, I would stand on my head for joy. October 19th, 1512, at age 28, he earned his doctorate in theology. And then he was called to Wittenberg to take the chair of biblical theology. So at this time, he's still an Augustinian monk. In 1515, he would be translating and teaching the Bible when he happened upon Romans 117. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's the Protestant Reformation. That's where it started. The Protestant Reformation... Didn't start with the 95 Theses. The Protestant Reformation started with Luther translating a Greek, a Greek New Testament, coming to Romans 117, translating, and going, wow, wait a second. The righteous will live by faith. Luther struggled with Catholic teachings of the selling of indulgences and even the pontiff's position itself. In 1517, Luther would post his 95 Theses on the Castle Church in Wittenberg. So Desiree, posting statements on the church door was actually common. That's how, if somebody had something to say, that's how they would say it. It was like posting something on your own Facebook wall. Right. Okay. 
And I, I hate to use that stupid analogy, but it pretty much, I mean, that's what it was. If you had something to say, if you wanted to talk about, let's talk this out. You would post the thing on the, on the, on the door. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people would meet in the pub or whatever and discuss it. Okay. Um, here are some of my favorites. This is some of my big, my big 95s called. This is what I call my big 95. I'm just joking. I don't call. I just came up with that. My big 95s. Maybe if we have merch, we can say big 95. Maybe. Maybe. She's, Desiree's giving me the sign to move on. Here we go. Number 62. Number 62. The true treasure of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and the grace of God. Therefore, this is 65. Therefore, the treasures of the gospel are nets on which one formerly fished for men of wealth. The, this is 66. The treasures of indulgences are the nets in which one now fishes for the wealth of men. 82. Such as why? This is one of the most famous ones right here. This is, this is, this is the one that gets quoted all the time. Why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of the holy love and the dire need of the souls that are there if he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of the miserable money with which to build a church, the former reason would most would be most just. The latter is most trivial. And 93, blessed are all those prophets who say to the people of Christ, cross, cross, and there is no cross. There was something different that happened with Luther's 95 thesis because it was picked up and made into a pamphlet. Now, there were what they call proto-reformers. Um, two examples, two of these guys were John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. And by the way, Hus was burned at the stake. The Catholics did not like what he had to say. Um, they made many points that Luther made, um, but they lacked the means of reaching a larger audience. What was the, what was the difference maker? It was Gutenberg's printing press. Gutenberg's invention of the movable face type in the press meant that books could now be printed in large numbers, sold cheaply, and distributed widely. Desiree, if you lived back then and you wanted the Bible, you would pay a guy a year's salary, essentially, to to write a Bible. And I don't have you ever heard like the term the family Bible? Mm-hmm. So like that's kind of where that idea came from. Yeah. A family would have a Bible. And it would be passed down. It would be passed down, yeah. So it was very expensive. I mean, you think a year's salary. Right. Okay, so whatever, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, today's terms, today's money. You'd get a you know, a year later you'd get a Bible. With the printing press now, they could they could hash out a page, stamp it, didn't make hundreds of them, make the next page. It was wonderful. The major thought that the major thought was without the printing press, a 95 thesis would have just been debated in nerdy theological circles and probably would have been lost to history. We don't know if that's true because what is true is what went viral. That pamphlet. Luther wanted to reform the Catholic Church and not start a new church. So in 1518, Luther is summoned to appear before the cardinal in Osberg to defend his views. He refused to recant and asserts that only scripture holds ultimate authority. In 1520, Luther publishes three influential works to the Christian nobility of the German nation, the Babylonian captivity of the church and on the freedom of the Christian. These writings challenge the authority and teachings of the Catholic church. In 1521, Luther is excommunicated by Pope Leo X in January. In April, he appears before the Diet of Worms, a meeting of the Holy Roman Empire, and again refuses to recant his beliefs. As a result, he is declared an outlaw by Emperor Charles V. Okay, so the Diet of Worms is where he had his famous Here I Stand quote. My conscience is captive to the word of God, thus I cannot and will not recant, because acting against one's conscience is neither safe nor sound. Here I stand, I could go no further, God help me. That's so bold. It's one of the most metal, big stones things ever said. I said it. It's metal and it's big stones. I love it. I'll, I'm, I'm like, man, that's I, I'm ready. If I ever got a quote, uh, a tattoo quote, it'd probably be that. Something like a big, big old, like I'd put that on a battleship right on my chest. Yeah. Here I stand. I love it. I absolutely, it's so good. It's so good. The Protestant Reformation is so good. Um, Luther, ha- Luther had some... Mm. <laughs> 
can you imagine standing there and he just that's that's what comes to mind oh man it's so good thank god for martin luther in 1522, Luther returns to Wittenberg and begins translating the New Testament into German, making the Bible more accessible to the common people. In 1525, Luther married Catherine von Bora, a former nun, and their marriage actually became a model for the clerical marriage within the Protestant Reformation. Do you know the story about how they met? Uh, very little. Okay, let me. I'll it's give been, you. It's been a while. Since I, I'll, I'll give you the. I'll give you the Cliff's Notes versions. Yeah. She was. Her and other nuns were smuggled out in wine barrels. Yeah. Okay. That was a good, That's good. <laughs> it's a good story. It, it's kind of like internet dating. Yeah. It's wine barrel dating. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. So they were smuggled out in wine barrels, and uh, Luther, you know, he picked out a wife. I'm just that's not how it happened. No. But, but I mean, they, they, it is true they were smuggled out in wine barrels. But I don't know if he picked out the. I mean, I just nobody like they were refugees basically. Mm-hmm. And yeah. He um, saved her life. Yep. So same year, he and Erasmus. So the same year, so he gets Luther gets married. And he's like in his forties, and she's in her twenties. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I mean, whatever. Okay. Um, that same year, so he gets married, and guess what he does for his honeymoon? Uh, he argues with Erasmus uh, about the bondage of the will. So that's that's Luther's honeymoon. Sounds like a good time. They they, they end up having six kids. That's good. Erasmus was tasked by the Pope to defend the salvation of good works. So it was key. Uh, it was key for the for the for the Catholic Church because of again, it's like the selling of indulgences, and you know, part of you know going to mass and part of staying in grace is attending mass. You you are saved by works. It's a salvation by works. So um, Erasmus was tasked by the Pope to defend salvation. It, it was it was key to the Catholic theology. In 1530, Luther's authors the. Osberg Confession, a key document that outlines the beliefs of the Lutheran Church, um, which he presents at the Diet of Augsburg. 1546, Martin Luther died in February 18th in Eisenberg, his birthplace. I want to back up. Luther nails the 95 Theses in 1517. Desiree, can you tell me what happened the decade prior? The decade prior? Yeah. So what happened in the fourteen the fourteen nineties? What happened? Oh, uh, the new land. Columbus discovered the new world. So can you imagine like so this is what's happening right now? Like the world is changing. I mean, you were talking about I mean I civilizations being built and yeah, like new, dis- new discoveries. I think that they I mean, I don't think they really thought the world was flat. Like I think there's, I mean, there's, there's really good evidence. They believe the world is round. Most, most, most people. That was a. I mean, people still believe, still think that the world is flat right now. Well, I know that, but I'm saying back then, I think that most everybody thought the world was round. I'm pretty sure. Reverse, like okay, most most people. Yeah. So, but again, I mean, so when I say air quotes, the world is no longer flat. Right. Okay. There is a whole other place. There's a whole other people right now. The Catholic Church is debating, and they've been debating: Do the Native Americans, the Indians, do they have souls? Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's what's happening right now. Like this is so we discover a new world. A decade later, we have the Protestant Reformation. So it's a lot happened. There's a lot going on, okay, in the world. So again, uh, 1546, Martin Luther died. So what are some of the theologies that came out of Luther's Reformation? Of course, the five souls of the Reformation, the bondage of the will. Okay, these are, the, these are, two, um, these are two of the three major theologies. And the third one is actually the doctrine of unconditional election. It was actually beginning to develop with Luther. So Luther's debate with Erasmus. Erasmus argued for free will on the grounds similar to the Pelagianists. Luther wrote his greatest work, Bondage of the Will, in refutation of this position. Luther acknowledged that men make choices, but believed that in the area of choosing God, the will of man has no power. So this is Luther. A man without the spirit of God does not do evil against his will, under pressure as though he were taken by the scruff of the neck and dragged into it like a thief being dragged off against his will to punishment, but he does it spontaneously and voluntarily. And the, this willingness of volition is something which he cannot in his own strength eliminate, restrain, or alter. He goes on willing and desiring to do evil 
And if external pressures force him to act otherwise, nevertheless, his will within remains averse to so doing and chafes under such constraint and opposition. This is important because when he says um, he does it spontaneously and voluntary, the reformers we're going to look at in a little bit um, stoicism, fatalism, and even Gnosticism. The reformers, there's a lot of thought, there's a lot of, there's a theory, let's call it a theory, that the reformers are reading in Gnosticism, um, they're reading in fatalism, they're reading in Greek determinism into scripture, and the reformers never taught that. They never believed that. I mean, there's there's strong evidence, again, spontaneously and voluntarily. You're doing this, you're, you're doing, you're making the decision. You're acting, your will is acting. I'll, Luther said, though, your will is in bondage. And then the last thing, so we have, again, the five souls of the Reformation, the bondage of the will, and the doctrine of unconditional election was being was beginning to be developed. Luther says, while well, justification is the doctrine upon which the church stands or falls, Luther saw the doctrine of the sovereignty and predestination of God as the hinge on which it all turns. So Desiree, meanwhile in France, I always like saying that, France, 1523, Calvin begins studying at the University of Paris, where he studies theology and the classics and law. Calvin receives his bachelor's in arts and begins studying law at the University of Orleans. I have a lot in common with Calvin. I am a Calvinist, and I went to New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and he went to the University of North of Orleans, Old Orleans. So I went to New Orleans, and he went to Old Orleans. Hmm. And I digress. Calvin's father urged him to switch his studies to theology, and he began studying under the prominent scholar. Calvin's father urged him to switch his studies to theology, and he begins and he begins to study under prominent scholars. 1533, Calvin experiences a religious conversion and embraces the Protestant faith. 1536, Calvin travels to Geneva, Switzerland, where he's asked by the Protestant reformers to establish a religious community based on his theological principles. 1538, Calvin is banished from Geneva due to political conflicts, but continues to work on his theological writings during his exile. 1541, Calvin is invited back to Geneva, where he becomes a leading figure in the city's Reformation movement and helps establish a theocratic government. Uh, also, um, Calvin, because this is left out of the timeline, but I'm just going to add this. Uh, they burned a guy at the stake, too, for denying the Trinity. Who did? Uh, Geneva. Oh. But Calvin was in charge. Calvin actually wrote the guy and said, hey, don't come to Geneva. They're going to burn you. And he still showed up. But they blame it on Calvin. He was in charge. Mm. Anyway. 1549, Calvin marries um, Adelette de Bure, a widow with children, after the death of his first wife. In 1559, Calvin helps draft the ecclesiastical ordinances, which establish a system of church discipline and governance in Geneva. In 1564, John Calvin died on May 27th in Geneva at the age of 54. All right, there's another player, Jacob Arminius. Jacob Arminius was a systematic theology professor at the University of Leiden, Holland. After his death in 1609, his students protested the Dutch Confession. This brought about the, the Synod of Dort. So it's church nerd time. Uh, it was actually the second Synod of Dort. It wasn't the first. This was the, they were at protesting the second. Um, there was some skirmishes, minor Reformation skirmishes, some stabbings, some drive-by stabbings that were happening, a lot of up, up, uprisings. Again, the five points of Calvinism were response to Arminius' challenge to what the Calvinists believed was the gospel. The tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, the perseverance of the saints, was a summarization of the canons of Dort. They believed they were defending the gospel. Okay, they believed they were defending the biblical data. They weren't making a thing up because John Calvin taught the Reformed doctrines of predestination. They called it Calvinism because Calvin popularized the 
the theology of the Reformed Doctrine of Predestination based on the biblical data. So it wasn't because they loved him so much. It wasn't because they loved him so much. Well, I mean, sure, they, they had a healthy I'm amount sure of respect they did, for him. But that wasn't the, the motivation. The motivation mm. was defending the gospel. Yes, yeah, so they they named it, they named it, they, it was Calvinism because it was the doctrines of Calvin. It was what they believed, again, was the defense of the gospel. This, somebody's going to hear this, they're not going to care. Whatever. That's what happened. Take it or leave it. That's what the historical data says. And that was the whole Protestant Reformation. I'm just joking. Mm -hmm. That was, that's not the whole Protestant Reformation. Yeah. As we asked earlier, wasn't that... Doesn't it doesn't it feel good to listen to John Piper preach? Oh yes. <laughs> he feeds my soul. That guy, guy can that guy can preach. Oh man. He so like, he like reminds me of my grandpa. When yeah. He preaches. Oh man. John Piper feeds my soul. Uh I saw I saw I call him Papa Piper. Mm-hmm. I call him Papa Piper. He does. He reminds me of how yeah. my grandpa preached. So um as we asked earlier, if Calvinism is so great, why is it under attack? Why do people hate it? Desiree, I got a question. What is a major characteristic of a crumbling house? If I think about our house, if it if the foundation shook. Yeah. So if it has a if it has a bad foundation. Bad foundation. Yes. So one critique of Calvinism is that it's just Greek determinism that we've read in the scripture. So again, if Calvinism is just this X thing, this secular philosophy repackaged, then it's wrong. Mm-hmm. So we all have presuppositions. And so we're reading our our presuppositions into the text. So what some people are saying is that Calvinism is just repackaged Greek determinism, the default view of man, and we're just presupposing that in the scripture and we're not seeing God's actual true sovereignty and which is he doesn't he God doesn't have free will. We have the free will and he sort of just sees the future and the future he sees is the future that he's that I guess somehow he was sovereign over. I I don't know. I can't explain that anyway. So there's some that say that Calvinism is just Greek stoicism and Greek determinism repackaged. This is one of the weaker non-biblical arguments to Calvinism, but it is a critique. So it is a critique that's out there. So the example we're going to look at is from a man named Michael Pearl. And he has a ministry has several, actually has several ministries, but, one of the, the, I think the overarching umbrella is it's called No Greater Joy Ministry. Michael and his wife, Debbie, are members of the Quiverful Movement with the Gaithers. And you might remember the Gaithers from the Shiny Happy People's documentary about the Duggars. Desiree, do you remember that? Yes. Yes. Okay. That was all. Oh, that was the beginning of the summer. That was all that people talked about. So they've written some controversial books and one in Eden, which Debbie Pearl wrote, blaming the wife of a pastor for cheating on him. Desiree, what do you think about that? Yikes. Uh, as a wife, it's a little infuriating. Um, I think victim blaming. Uh, I'm Essentially, she's a victim of her husband's actions. And it's pretty despicable. Yeah. Um, it, it was ultimately his sin. And I, if, if that were happened to us, like a, your sin is not necessarily like on my shoulders it's not your fault yeah that sin that particular sin yeah no it's not it's not your fault you right. you the uh i do believe like where are the responsibilities there where where's the fault lie i i do believe one or two of the fruits of the spirit is uh patience and uh self-control self-control yeah teach my my kinders that self-control Self-control, fruits That's of the one spirit. one of our social contracts. Mm-hmm. But also, I remember in when um, the Duggars, speaking of, um, they're a part of that. They were a part of that. I, bring, I don't know if they still are. Um, the Gaither. Oh, they, they, right? are, they are trying to be, they're trying to take it over. They're, yes. They're, yes. Okay. So in that, um, when that whole thing happened with, the eldest Josh um, it was insinuated that she was to stay with him that it was her 
responsibility, her wifely duties. She wasn't fulfilling her wifely duties, and so it was hit her fault, basically, um, that she took part of the blame for his bad behavior and his uh, illegal actions. Yeah. So, And it just turns out that Josh Duggar is just a big sin bag that big. needs to repent. <laughs> he, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Among yes. Yes. I, I I don't know any I don't know a nicer just yeah. loving in Christ way to put it. He's a big sin bag that needs to repent. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um. So doors. I'm sorry. Uh. Pearl's YouTube channel is called the Door, and it currently has. It's actually the biggest channel we've covered. So we've covered several channels. It's the biggest. It's by like I would say by three or three or four fold. It's got 187 thousand subscribers. Um, and it is a very actually a very popular channel. It has a lot of comments. Um, he'll he'll uh, he'll talk about the Bible and he'll like throw axes. So that I mean that's actually pretty pretty sweet. Um, like he'll literally like throw axes hmm. and knives and like sharpen knives uh, while he talks about the Bible. I think that's what we're missing. I think that's the flavor we're missing. Anyway, maybe one day. Maybe one day <laughs> we'll incorporate that into the Five Flames oh, podcast. We'll think about it. Um, his. Most popular videos, which have close to a million views a piece, that is a million views, are about living in the end times and what to expect. Just just to tell you, like, the most popular Fox News show doesn't get a million views. I think that is just the one question everybody wants answered, and it's clearly stated we're not going to really know. <laughs> okay, so, well, don't, add, don't, don't tell him that because he'll tell you. Well. Yeah, okay. I think it's just popular. Everybody wants to know that. It is. It's super. Like I, I love saying it's that super is metal. The one question everybody wants to know is how's it going to end? end? Yeah. Um, what's actually confusing is that Pearl hates Calvinism and God's eternal decree. He refers to it again as fatalism and Greek stoicism, but he will absolutely tell you exactly how the world will end, who the beast is, and who will be and won't be raptured and when. So Calvinism is fatalism, but premillennial dispensationalism, pre-trib raptures, and wall charts, the fate of the world are 100% not fatalistic. Interesting. Does that make any sense to you? No. Even though, according to Pearl, God tells us how, why, and when the world will end, and Pearl himself has built a massive YouTube channel around this theology, God cannot be sovereign in salvation, but he can ordain who the beast will be. Hmm. So let me ask you a question. On that day, Desiree, when the beast is supposed to show up and be the beast, what if he's sick that day? What what's God going to do? Desiree, is there is there a substitute? I don't think there's a substitute beast. Is there a substitute beast? I think I don't know. Do they Maybe, have lesson plans for that? Because they don't have a substitute. I don't think the I don't think they have a substitute. I think the beast, according to Pearl, is going to be the beast. It'd probably okay. be like some Catholic guy, right? Well, he's been getting hit by a car. Okay, so like I'm just saying, like the 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 sheer butterfly of the sheer butterfly effect. You know, this thing over here affects this thing over here. A butterfly flaps his wings, and then Africa, there's a mm -hmm. there's a there's a storm, right? right. Okay. <laughs> um. It's complete. I'm not going to argue the merits of premillennial dispensationalism. There's some great men of God who are both Arminian and Calvinist who believe in that theology. I'm not here to debate that today, but we will be. Trust me, we will be going over that. Um. This guy hates Calvinism, says it's fatalism, but believes in the literal most fatalistic, stoic theology there is. So we're about to play a clip. In full disclosure, I did cut this up, um, but I will link the whole video in the description below. But I am not taking him out of context. So with that said, let's listen to the clip. It's about a minute and a half long. Uh, when I really discovered what Calvinists believe, <laughs> I knew that it wasn't what the Bible taught, and it certainly wasn't what I believe. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Don't have time to do much, but Calvinism is Lutheranism. Now, why do we say that? Because Luther was before Calvin, and he's the one who wrote Bondage of the Will, and all Calvin did was formalize it in such a way and made it popularized it across Europe, so it's called Calvinism. Calvinism is Augustinianism. Luther, in his book, Bondage of the Will, quotes Augustine on nearly every page, sometimes several times on a page. Uh, it's Greek and it's Roman fatalism. 
In other words, Augustine was schooled in the Greek and the Roman fatalism, and he syncretized and brought it over into his Christianity. It's heathen determinism, and it's the default position of fallen humanity. Augustine, this is his picture, 4th century, was formally trained in Stoicism. You know what a Stoic is, right? The guy sits there and looks at <laughs> sit there and looks at you and uh, endures pain, endures suffering, knowing that he all is foreordained and nothing you can do about it. It's karma. In his early life, he believed that a meticulous, micromanaging God predetermines every detailed event in the universe. So Calvinism existed in the heathen world a long time before Augustine and Luther picked up on it. It is the default position of fallen humanity. In other words, leave it to a sinner or a devil, he's going to arrive at a Calvinistic position. Desiree, why do these Protestants hate the Protestant Reformation so much? That's a good question. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, it just sounds like that's a heart and a pride issue. God does not need us to market him he does not need a marketing department that's exactly right he does not I, I i really do think you nailed it on the head right there i mean i think that a lot of these guys think that god needs a marketing department that like psalm 5 5 is just not a thing yeah there seems to be some type of hypocrisy because they're enjoying the fruits of luther and calvin's labor but they hate the theology hmm. so one of two things is going on with Pearl's thought process. Sorry, I stepped on my microphone cable and it pulled my mic down. Like I said, there seems to be one of two things going on in Pearl's thought process. One, he actually means Manichaean Gnosticism, but he doesn't know that determinism and Manichaeanism are two completely different things. Because the way he's talking is the way the, one of the other non-biblical critiques of Calvinism is that it's just Manichaean Gnosticism read into the scripture. Um... But I don't, I mean, Michael Pearl, like, he has college degrees. He seems like he's articulate. So I'm going to say he's not confused by that. So he actually thinks Augustine, Augustine read Greek Stoicism and Fatalism in the biblical text. Um, and we were going to argue the latter because five minutes of Googling can clear up the first. It's not to say that Augustine did not interact with Stoicism, he actually has a famous critique for it. Augustine maintains that the Stoic virtue ethic fails to deliver on its promised eschatological, that is death and judgment, so that's the ends, because it lacks a robust eschatological vision. For Augustine, the Christian faith offers a more viable virtue ethic. The Stoics argue that you should be virtuous for the sake of being virtuous. There is a sense that even pagans understand God's law. They come naturally. Romans 2.15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Uh, Augustine and the Stoics agree that human flourishing is fragile if it depends on any external goods, but the Stoics took this to show that virtue alone suffices for our happiness. Whereas for Augustine, it proved that true flourishing is impossible except in the kingdom of God. Yeah, so to be actually, to be happy, you have to have eternal life. That's what Augustine and said. And joy, like not happiness, but really joy. Yeah, to have, yeah, exactly right. To have joy, you have to have eternal life. Right. That's only offered in who? Through the kingdom of God. Through the Lord, yeah, Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Pearl also makes the point that Stoicism is a human default position, which is a good point. I mean, how many people do you know just say, Sarah, so, hey, what is it? Hey, Chris, croissant? Hey, Sarah, Sarah, what will be, will be? Oh, okay, Sarah. Okay, Sarah, Sarah. Um, croissant. Croissant, croissant. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid, I'm so dumb. <laughs> no, um, that makes me hungry. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, so they... You know, people will say, well, the universe wanted this to happen. Have you ever, have you ever heard somebody say yes, that? Yes, Okay, the universe, you know, oh, it's a total God thing. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, or karma. 
Karma. Yeah, people don't actually want karma. What people want is grace. Yeah, so... um, yeah, so he has a good point. Like stoicism is in that. You think about like, you know, we know people who are. He even makes the point. Military vet- veterans say, "Hey, if that bullet's for me, that bullet's for me. What's yeah. my fate is my fate." Yeah. Um. So let's we're actually let's let's do a little just a tiny little dive in the Greek determinism, just very quick. In Greek philosophy, determinism is also is often associated with the concept of fate or the polytheistic pantheon of gods that govern the universe. So the polytheistic pantheon of gods are sort of mingling in your life. The Stoics believed in a universe called the Logos. They believed in... Logos or Logos? It's, well, it doesn't matter. Lo, uh, in, tomato, tomatoes? Yeah, well, in, in Greek, the... Um, I've heard it. Yeah, I've so... heard it Logos. In, Logos. So in Greek, o, the O is actually A-H. But like I said last week, if you're doing it, you're doing it. You're doing it right. Okay. But yes, it is. It is. Um, tomato, tomato. Yeah, it's it's logos. Okay. That, that's how that's how we're gonna say it because that's how old Matt Morgan says it. Uh-huh. Okay. The Stoics believe that the universe, the universal order, is called the logos. They believe in cause and effect and logic. So think about like free will, like just cause and effect. This thing happens. Your kid breaks their arm. What is your free only free choice? Go to the hospital. Go to the hospital. Okay, like you are now. You have been determined to go to the hospital. It's time if it's to go. Us, we're like, yeah, let's wait a Epson, minute. Do a Epsom salt wrap. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We would not. But but I would. Oh no. I uh, would. Granny Morkin would say r- oh. wrap that thing in some Epsom salt. Yeah. <laughs> so my dad would say rub dirt on it. Rub dirt on it. No. So. But then don't rub it. Cause and effect. Cause and effect limits your free will. Um, and John 1, 1 starts off, John 1, 1, in Arche in Hologos. So John is actually digging at the Greco-Roman culture, explaining that Christ is the point of origin. So the Logos was the point of origin. Um, Prometheus and other, and other philosophers attributed determinism to an unchanging and eternal reality. He says, we can speak and think only of what exists, and what exists is uncreated and imperishable, for it is holy and unchangeably incomplete. In Greek philosophy, the concept of free will is often minim- uh, minimized or even denied, according to thinkers like Prometheus and the Stoics. Human beings are subject to predetermined courses of fate or divine order. While the Epicureans allowed for some degree of free will within a deterministic framework, it was still limited by the random movements of, of, of matter. In Greek philosophy, determinism is often seen as a way to find peace and acceptance in the face of an unchangeable and predetermined world. The Stoics, for example, believe that accepting one's fate and aligning oneself with the divine order leads to tranquility and virtue. I love movie references. So Man of Steel. Do you remember in Man of Steel, Desiree, when Jonathan Kent accept his fate to die in a tornado. Do you remember that in the Man of Steel? Mm-hmm. Okay, so Clark, so he sees th- th- there's a tornado coming and Clark's with his mom. He's protecting his mom, which, yes, let me die. Protect mom. Okay. And Clark Kent, Superman, could easily have saved Jonathan Kent. Like, he'd been there in less than a breath. Mm-hmm. Saved him and had him back. Right. However, Jonathan knew that if Clark did that, he would ex- expose his powers. And he didn't want people to, he wasn't time for him to, to be Superman yet. So he waved, he waved Clark on, waved him by. Nope, not, that's not, not now. And he died. He accepted his fate. Okay. Um, and again, he could have easily, Clark could have easily saved him, but Jonathan did not want Clark to reveal his powers. And again, he peacefully accepted his fate in the movie. Here's the deal. Is Pearl correct? No, he's not correct. There are some good points he makes. For example, stoicism is a default human position outside of Christ. But there's a massive difference from what we call God's decree and fatalism, which is why you can be a premillennial dispensationalist and say there's going to be a beast, and say there's going to be a pre-trib rapture, and say those things because God decreed it, and it's good. 
although we disagree with premillennial dispensationalism. But it is okay to say it's God's decree. So there's three reasons, and these three reasons actually kind of match the three aspects of fatalism. So first, God's sovereign decree. God's sovereign decree. Westminster chapter 3. God from all eternity did, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of the second cause taken away, but rather established. So what this is saying is, is that men are freely acting and God is freely acting. And if you think that's an issue, the issue is with you. If anybody can have free will, it's God. God can determine fate. Why can God determine fate? Because he's the most righteous judge. He's outside of time. He can see the beginning from the end. And we're about to see some scripture. He is the beginning and the end. He is the beginning. It's, that is very true. Thank you, Desiree. He's the Alpha and Omega. Mm-hmm. So when we say, well, is everything predetermined? Well, I mean, it's not that it's predetermined. It's been decreed by God. Right. And the thing is, is like God is good. And is God the author of sin? No. Did God create the trees to eat from? Yes. Did he create the option? Yes. Is he the author of sin? No. So what are some scriptures that support this? And I'm doing my best to take whole swaths of scripture so people can't say we're proof texting, but at the end of the day, somebody's going to grab this and they're going to say we're proof texting. Proof texting. Proof texting is where you make a point and you take like one scripture and you throw it. You, you know what I mean? You, you justify your yeah, justify your position with just like one scripture. So I try to take as big swaths of scripture so you can sort of see the context. But it's never. I mean, the thing is though, is I don't know if you notice this or not, Desiree. The Calvinist, Arminian, Provisionalist, are, there are camps, and they are like they're not camps; they're tribes. Yeah. Yeah. And so brutal. Brutal. Yep. It's brutal. So Ephesians 1, 7 through 11. You need to read it? I got it. Oh, yeah, you can read it. In him we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven, and things on earth. 11 says, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of of him who works in all things according to the counsel of his will. Yeah. I'm not sure how you can argue with that. <laughs> um, I'm sure someone can, and I'm sure they have. But I, I mean, I can tell you right now, we can get it. We're, we're going to get into this probably next week, but... Um, it's the term in him. They say there's some mystery, not mystery there, but that, that doesn't mean what you think it means. And then we have to, it's in him. It's not that it's not that this thing is, ha- it's, it's happened in him. Um, uh, but that's not the point. The point is God's eternal decree. Have we have been, so in him, we have been ob- we obtained inheritance. It was from the foundation of the earth was the plan for Christ to die on the cross. This brings the problem of evil to both Arminians, Provisionalists, and Calvinists. Okay. Any, 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 all three of us have to answer the problem of evil because from the foundation of the earth, it was Christ's plan to die on the cross. Right. That was God's decree. That was God's decree. It's not that God looked forward and saw that we would sin because that's not what it says. Having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So what is he doing? He's working all things according to the counsel of his will. They might also say there's a little bit of, uh, well, he's working these things out. So like man sinned and he was like, what am I going to do? You know, but even still, that doesn't work. All right. Psalm 135, uh, five through six. For I know that the Lord is great 
and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth and in, in the seas and all depths. I'm going to stop right there. Whatever the Lord does, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. That's Yahweh. When, that be, whatever Yahweh pleases, he does in heaven and on earth. Mm-hmm. It's not really, it's not really what that means. <laughs> it's not, that, that, uh, it's not, that's not really what that means. It doesn't mean that. What, did, what does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> but that's not what that means. It doesn't mean that. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Wait, hold on. What? Hold on. What? 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 Calvinism is legitimate. Thanks, Brian. Okay. Isaiah 46, 8 through 11. Remember this and stand firm. We call it to mind your transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country, I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. Who's doing it? Not me. God's doing it. Um, so Greek determinism is missing God's eternal decree. So it's this, it's a this logos, this point of origin, and then history is unraveling from the logos, and you sort of you have this determinism and fatalism. And and I'm not even gonna say in Calvinism, in the Bible, is coming from the most righteous judge who is totally patient and totally kind and can totally work out all the evil, bad things into something good, who totally intends all these horrible, bad things that happen for good. That's who's determining these things. Not some psychopath that you can't wrap your mind around. Yeah, I'm... I'm not saying you, Desiree. I'm just saying you, second person, you. No, no, no. I know. But I'm thinking it it is a good thing that I am not God and that I can't do that. (laughs) Oh, for real. Because, I mean, as a human, it's we have a lot of different emotions, and we try to tie our emotions and understand and wrap God into our emotions that we experience, and it just doesn't fit. Yeah, it. it He's well, a different package. Well, God, and then actually, you, you say that God. There's literally a theology that says God is immutable. We talked about it last week. So, immutability of God says He doesn't have emotions. Um, some people would say his immutability, he does have emotions, like he displays a type, some well, types. there is emotion. I mean, there's there's anger, there's just, Well, there's, there's so love. there's Yeah, so there's, I would say instead of anger, I would say wrath hmm. and justice. Mm-hmm. But he's not swayed by his emotions. So you know, right. like, if something, if some, you, you I get, sure am. Yeah. So he's not, so it's not that God can't, and, and I, I'm kind of on the fence, I'm a fence sitter when it comes to his immutability. Like, I, I read like Hosea, and he's like real mad. Mm-hmm. But like, you know, he he's wrathful. Yeah, he's like you said. Yeah, he's wrath. So, yeah. but his wrath is just. Mm-hmm. So it's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Like his wrath is his mm-hmm. wrath is good. My wrath is not always just. No, no. So yeah, so that's the thing. His wrath is good. Like if God, if if God is wrathful, it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. Um. So I'm a fence center because of immutability. I understand, like, you say if God has an emotion, he's not, it's not that God doesn't have a feeling about something, because whatever his feeling about that thing is, that's the right thing, that's, that's mm-hmm. the truth. Um, so in that sense, he's immutable, but... It's just not on our level. It's not, it's yeah. Just, yeah. It's just not in our realm. It's not, we are created in his image, but not exactly like him. So, mm-hmm. last verse, Acts four twenty seven through 28, and we're going to talk about this a lot next week. G.I. Williamson explains that the free actions of men are also predestined by God. They are free and predestined. That is, those who commit these acts do so because they want to. We're going to get into this a little bit more in the bondage of the will in the second point. So last verse, Acts 4, 27 through 28. We're going to get into this a lot next week. For truly in this city, 
There were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. It does already, God doesn't predestine things. Okay. So we're going to break this down more next week, but just think like how many wills, how many free wills were, were, were in play here? You have um, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, thousands of people, and the peoples of Israel, thousands of people. And all their will, all their wills, all their free choices bent bent um, to do whatever the hand of your plan had predestined to take place. We're going to break the, that. In the Old Testament, from the beginning of man, from the beginning of creation. From the foundation of the earth, Christ was predestined yep. so to die on the cross. When. Way back gonna, when. It was going to happen. Yep. And again, we're going to go over more of this next week. Or maybe the week after. I don't know. Next week might be so big, we might have to push that in another week. We'll see. The second reason why Greek determinism and Stoicism is not accurate is because it doesn't leave room for the bondage of the will to sin. Genesis 3, 2 through 12. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said... You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Verse 8. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten? From the, of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman who you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Williamson, in his book, The Westminster Confession of Faith for Study Classes, explains, God's interpretation of things was original and determinative. God's interpretation could be right only if it was non-original and determinative. But as soon as Adam sought to know, to make interpretation apart from the subjection of God's word, Genesis 3, 6, he was lost and holy in error. And as soon as the authority of God's word was rejected, that's 3, 4, the authority of man's own reason enthroned, 3, 5 through 6, it became necessary for Adam to deny that fall had happened as God said. Thus we note in three twelve that Adam begins to act as the original defect was not his act, performed in actual history, but rather something inherent in creation itself, and thus, in a sense, prior to our behind history. Romans six fifteen through 18. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of the teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in your sins and trespasses and sins, which you once walked, 
following the course of this world, following the prince and the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. We all once lived in these passions of our flesh. We all once were carrying out the desires of our body and our mind, and we are all by nature children of wrath. And the last point, and we already actually covered this in God's decree, and it's why does he do all this stuff? And it's God's own purpose. So again, in Ephesians, in whom we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So what is the chief end of man? The first question in the Westminster Catechism. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 1 Corinthians 10.31. So whether you eat or drink or whether you, whatever you do, do all the glory of God. Greek determinism and fatalism is missing one key detail, and that's Yahweh. The difference is Yahweh. The difference is the Logos. The difference is the Holy Spirit. So Pearl's right by saying that Greek determinism and fatalism is man's default position. However, um, we've been regenerated. Those who believe have been regenerated. So Desiree, moving on. Was that good? That was good. That was some good theology. That was some good Bible. I enjoyed it. Yes. Uh, so Desiree, Stephen Avery's back in the news lately. What's up with that? Man, this guy won't go away. <laughs> it's been like, what, how long? Uh, Almost a decade. 2015, was it 15? 15, yeah. So Manitowoc, Manitowoc, God, Manitowoc, Manitowoc, Manitowoc. They, how they say it real fast? Manitowoc. I can't. I can't. I can't. The southern accent can't say that northern accent. Manitowoc. So Manitowoc. My from Wisconsin. He could probably say it. He probably could. So this is uh, from August 24th of this year, a couple weeks ago. Attorney of, for Stephen Avery, Catherine Zellner, announced Thursday that her team is appealing Avery's case to the Wisconsin Court of Appeals, District 2, this comes after Stephen Avery's latest appeal was denied. Avery's attorney, Catherine Zellner, had previously requested a new trial, arguing that new evidence and witnesses uh, provided her client or proved her cl- client's innocence. Spoiler alert, it was denied. Yep. As previously reported, Zellner has pointed to a third party suspect in the 2005 murder of Teresa Halbach, for which Stephen Avery was convicted. So I want to talk about something, and I have no idea. I didn't Google this, but I think I invented a term, Desiree. It is called movementism. Hmm. So there seems to have been a lot of movementism in 2010 to 2020. I mean, it's always been there, but it seems uh, in our adult life, it's pretty prevalent right now. I think the social meds, I think mm-hmm. the social medias really kind of came, you know, they're, they're really like. We have experienced that. Yes in our own neighborhood Facebook. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were doxxed in our own neighborhood because <laughs> of our loud dogs. Um, um, one dog. Starting in 2010, you now have like Twitter, Facebook coming into full maturity. I mean, these things are like, they're, they're mainstream. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so there's that aspect. Uh, so we have some, so here we go. We have Trayvon Martin happened in, I think, 2013. So we have Hands Up, Don't Shoot happening in August of 2014. So if you remember a police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and then it was adopted on the protest again against police brutality elsewhere in the United States. Um, we have now, and then we have Avery, the outcry of Stephen Avery and the Innocence Project of 2015. We have the Me Too movement of 2017. So COVID-19 in this, uh, yeah, so COVID-19, you know, you don't wear a mask. So that you remember when they said don't wear a mask? The very beginning. The very beginning they said don't wear a mask. Mm-hmm. And then they said you must wear a mask. Mm-hmm. Okay. They said stay home to save lives. And then they were like, why aren't you staying home? Or they were said, they said stay home for two weeks. Mm-hmm. And then two years later, <laughs> they're like, why aren't you staying home? Mm-hmm. Um, and why do you want to kill grandma? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we have uh, again horrible the George the George Floyd um, 
protest and the horrible thing that happened to George Floyd. And then you have the Kenosha unrest and the trial that eventually exonerated Kyle Rittenhouse. So you have these, um, these movements. The big, I mean, there were many more, many more, yes. but those were the ones that stuck out. And some of these movements were good and righteous. And some of these were started under false pretenses or, uh, there's been a lot there, of inaccuracy. There was, there were inaccurate. Yes. There were, there was false pretense. The issue was what a lot of these were witch hunts, but they had witches. Mm-hmm. So they're witch hunts with, with witches. For example, me too. Me too was a witch hunt. So if you were a guy and you put your hands on somebody that you weren't, you, know, you hug somebody too tight, you could have been me too. Uh, but there was also Weinstein right, who was fed. Did the awful deeds. Yes, did it. Yes. He was fed young girls. So it was a, it was a scary time, uh, especially parents that have sons um, that are, you know, innocent boys right now growing up, like seeing their future. What does that look like for them? Having a, they have also having a daughter. You know, what does her future hold? What does that look like for her? And so, wanting to protect both of them, um, that was that was a that was a scary time as a mama. Yeah, uh, worrying about you know having having uh, those thoughts. So praying, praying diligently for my children. <laughs> Yeah, so again, it, it was, a lot of these were, I mean, are, are there bad cops? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, are there, are most cops good? Yeah. Okay, so there are bad cops and there's good cops. There yeah. are, there there it's a witch hunt, but it had witches. Yeah. And um, so Stephen Avery brought enough doubt to the viewers of the, the original Netflix documentary, and there's been two mm-hmm. seasons. So he brought in that case brought enough doubt to the viewers that saw what they perceived to be an injustice and factual. It like spurred a whole movement. And it was, um, it, I'm just gonna come out and say it. It was the white folks, Trayvon Martin. That's what it's been compared to. Really? Yeah. I'm not, that is that I, you can Google it. Oh. Yep. So, um, I don't, and, how, I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> well, I just don't know how I feel about that. Just don't have a feeling about it. I just don't. Yep. I don't have an opinion about that. Um. So again, the Netflix highly edited, and, and it's come out that Netflix has highly edited edited the evidence and created a narrative. They cre- Netflix created a narrative. What, like seven years later. Well. We're we're, we're finding this out. We're yeah. finding. Well, well, I'm sure we're there, there, well, there. We knew there was a lot of people who knew there yeah. was people who came out like Reddit got a hold of this. And that became you talk about camps, the the oh, Avery, the guilty, the, I think the guilty, the guilters and the truthers. I think I'm that's what they call them. OK, yeah. yeah. So they're just as campy as they're just as uh, tribal as a uh, as Calvinist on Arminians anyway. Yeah. Um, so Desiree, do you think you did it? Absolutely, hundred percent, hundred percent. My God. girl Candace Owens came out with a new documentary that just solidified that for me. Yeah, I would definitely say if, as long as the Daily Wire is not heavily editing what they're putting out, which I mean, it's it's possible. I'm sure if there's some editing. Going okay, on, but it's possible, but it seems to be there. They seem to be playing like some of these phone calls in full context. Right. And it seems to be destroying the Avery narrative. It, 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 you know, I believed he did it. I, I definitely doubled down on he did it. Yeah. Um, that's how I'm feeling. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how my feeling on that. So, um, so as we always talk and, you know, as we begin to close out this podcast, that probably won't be an hour and a half long, but it's going to be close. <laughs> um, Calvinism is a life system that sees God for who he truly is and sees man for who he truly is. Desiree, what do we deserve apart from Christ? Oh, death. Death. Ecclesiastes 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, I want to want to play this. It's a very disturbing clip, and I did my best to, um, to uh, edit it. Um, 
And so this is what Stephen Avery thinks he deserves. And this is, again, the testimony of his ex fiance. He told me once, excuse my language, because of the one that sent him to prison the first time. We all owed him. So she basically she said all, you know what? He said, she, he said, she said, this is some, he said, she said, mm. uh, she said, he said all B words this is a family show. All B words owe him for what happened to him. Send him to prison. Um, and, um, so he could do whatever he, he could do whatever he wanted. Um, I personally think Avery did it because he thought the world owed him something. This is being boastful. And what we know about God is the boastful will not stand before the Lord. It's now time for our exciting announcement. We have partnered with Snake Crusher Products to bring you some of the finest, high-quality beard oil and tattoo balm in existence. We'll be giving you more information in the next couple of weeks and doing a deep dive on what these products can offer. Please check out our link tree in the description below as we get more information. Desiree, that's it for the pod show. Make godly covenants, keep covenants, build institutions for the glory of God. Good morning, good day, good evening, wherever you may be. 